So I am uh, going on live on the breakfast show with faithfm.com.au at roughly 438. We'll see how close it is to that. And I wanted to invite you to join in with me for that. So I'm just kind of, I'm listening to the breakfast show right now in Australia. I will turn that up for a second. I'm going to check over my notes and I'm going to invite you to hang out. You can either go to faithfm.com.au and listen to the show there, or you can stream it right here on my Facebook channel, Facebook page, and there will be a copy of it later. Listening to Andrew Peterson with Izzy Worthy here on Faith FM. Now, in a historic move, the Prime Minister and Leader of the Opposition yesterday officially apologized to victims of Institutional child sex abuse, which uh, we absolutely welcome here, um, as efforts you know being put forward to stamp this out. Um, of course, as was noted, there were those who boycotted the apology, stating that whatever the Catholic Church remained the only institution exempt from mandatory reporting of child sex abuse allegations, the apology was a bit of a, a hollow uh, apology at best. Yeah, because it is apologising really enough anyway. Yeah, actions speak louder than words. Absolutely. However, no church or institution, including ours, uh, is exempt from the danger of child sex abuse. And joining us on the phone from the United States is Sarah McDougall. Now, Sarah is a popular international speaker, author, blogger, YouTuber, leadership development coach. She works with female abuse victims. She advocates for teen girls, pastors, wives, uh, abuse victims, plus initiatives against human trafficking, pornography, and addressing abuse in faith communities. In fact, their list of accomplishes is very long indeed. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a delight to join you guys. Glad to be here. Now, Australia has been you know, rocked by these findings of our Royal Commission into Child Sex Abuse, and we regularly hear reports from you know, uh, things like grand juries in the United States. Mm -hmm. How widespread is this problem? <laughs> well, you know, it, I have to say it warms my heart to see so much definitive action being taken by the Australian government to address these generations of abuse that were never dealt with before. But if I'm very honest, I feel like my own government in the United States has a really long way to go before we reach that same level of transparency, even to just get that apology and I know you're, you guys are saying that that apologies may ring hollow because actions speak louder than words but we're still short of even that apology so I'm I'm thrilled to hear what's happening in Australia I think that's fantastic um, what what I really believe though is that the problem is more widespread than the average person can imagine because churches and faith communities of all kinds are prime environments for abuse. They're structured around loyalty to the organization, loyalty to the leaders, and often around making this idea of making the corporate community look good at any cost. So silence is pretty easily accomplished with a dose of shame and some twisted scripture. So I, I believe that this is a much more widespread problem than any of us would like to admit. Okay, so you know, should we should should we be scared of taking our children to church, sending them to school, this kind of? Thing? Yeah, because really, if you think about it, with the with the Catholic Church saying, do you know what, we're not going to do mandatory reporting, it sort of, in my mind, sort of flagged red flag church as a non safe place anymore. Like, just, you know, I, don't, I would think twice about taking my kids to a Catholic church where priests are refusing to do mandatory reporting. So, you know, should we be scared to send our kids to church or school? Um, just, just confirming that that's in the confession of box, but yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, right, right, right. And, and okay. Course, this exists within within our church as well, and yes, you know, you work with a lot of different people from many faith communities. I do. It exists in all churches, mm -hmm. and so um, yeah, across the board, should, should we be afraid? I, I think we should be very cautious, and I think we should be very wise. I believe that God does not give us a spirit of fear but he gives us a, a clear mind and a spirit of love and power. And so, no, I don't think we should live in fear. And I think living in fear makes people become reactive instead of proactive. And so while I don't believe we should live in fear, I do believe that we should be wise and cautious and very, very astute. And I think we should take preemptive action to educate ourselves and educate our children and cultivate healthy, open relationships with our kids so that they have safe people to talk to if anything happens to them, God forbid, or to their friends who may not have those safe, healthy, open relationships with someone to talk to. Okay, so the other you know, question goes right along with this. Why has it taken our government so long to address this issue? I mean, you can go back to you know, Charles Chinnicky, who was flagging this in the United States. 
during the Lincoln administration. Yeah, just just a little Why bit ago, just belong? a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> just a wee bit ago. Um, <laughs> you know, I <laughs> I believe personally there are three reasons for this. One is perpetrator bias, and that is a sense of subconscious loyalty to people accused of doing really bad things who look just like me. So when the perpetrator looks a lot like me, it's very hard, or it, or is one of my friends, and and let's just be honest in government and in, and I am by no means saying that all perpetrators are white and male, but for the perpetrators that are white and male, which would be a lot of Catholic priests, a lot of Christian pastors, a lot of people in power, when those in law enforcement and politics look just like them, there's a lot of perpetrator bias. And so it's very hard for someone to believe that someone who looks just like me is capable of doing things like that. Number two, perpetrator identity. And that is, the simple fact that there are a lot of people in power who actively protect themselves because they are among the perpetrators and they do not want to make laws harder for people who do things that they also like doing. That's a, a nasty, scary thing to think, but it exists. And three is just naivety. This pervasive refusal to believe that so much evil could exist all around us. Because here's the thing, people want to believe that we can that we can sense evil. We want to believe that we could, if, if somebody was really, really wicked, if somebody was capable of heinous acts against someone else that's vulnerable, that we would know. And the truth is we can't. And so we prefer to believe that the world is good and filled with good people around us instead of opening our eyes to realizing that the very charming people that we may hang out with might also be capable of evil. Mm -hmm. Now, Sarah, you obviously travel the world speaking on these kind of subjects. Um, here in Australia, in the United States, our governments are actively addressing this, this problem, which is a fantastic thing. Um, are there other countries where there's nothing being done and it's just free reign? Absolutely. I would say Australia and the US and the UK are barely scratching the surface of what exists in our own countries, and we are dealing with it quite openly. Um, in other places, sexual abuse is often either completely covered up or it's rampant and out in the open as an accepted part of culture and neither extreme is acceptable. But it is, there are many, many places in the world that it is just either completely in secret and pervasive or just wide open. Sure. Sarah, yeah. um, sorry, Sarah, we actually heard about you because you made a uh, video clip that ended up going uh, <laughs> viral. And, uh, and it was about uh, an encounter you had with a potential predator in your church, mm -hmm. uh, which you were very brave about confronting. Um, so how, is it, how viral did that clip actually go? <laughs> you know, that's a great question. I kind of stopped counting. Um, last I checked, it had over 180,000 views on Facebook thousands of comments, thousands of shares, and I, I, I just gave up on trying to plow through all of the feedback unless people messaged me with specific questions where I was able to actually directly help. Yes, I know. I, I, saw, it, I saw it pop, on my, pop up on my Facebook there you know, on a regular basis as it was continually being shared and shared. And, and That's crazy. For, you know, Crazy. <laughs> well, it's clearly an issue that people, uh, you know, are interested in that resonates with. It's, it's clearly something that society is concerned about. Um, so, and this this predator that was, he was literally grooming your children in front of you. Yes. Um, and he he really picked the wrong place to attempt <laughs> grooming them. Yep, wrong place, um, wrong mama. Like, give us a yeah, give us a little uh, a taste of, of what actually happened. Give us a well, you know, I, I actually, I, I think, how about I repost the video on my Facebook page today and you can go watch it. Any Anybody who yeah. wants to hear that story, I took about 20 minutes to tell it. I'd driven home from church. I sent my children into the house because they were only slightly aware that something had happened and mommy took care of something. And so I did not want them to be completely freaking out over everything that I had realized was going on. I sent them into the house. I sat in my car and I did a video rant and I had no idea that it was going to take off like wildfire and go all over the world um, and just swamped with stuff. So uh, I will repost it on my Facebook page. And if you go to Sarah McDougall Author, that's S-A-R-A-H-M-C-D-U-G-A-L Author on Facebook, um, I will post it as soon as we're done. And anybody who wants to see it can check that video out and share it again because I, <laughs> I was fired up. That's, that's what I'll say. <laughs> Yes, it was. Coming to the defense of my kids. And, uh, and I think that's what really gave it so much impact was that you know, 
just taken place. It was fresh. You sat in the car, and uh, and it was, it was <laughs> cool, and it was real, and it was powerful. And um, well, we're thank you. Up the links to that on the, on our Facebook page, so people can go and check out that. If if you're amongst those uh, few people living under a rock, we may have missed it. <laughs> but um, anyway, okay. So coming back to our churches, mm -hmm. and our churches need to be a safe place. Um, we need to look out for our children. We need to look out for not just our personal children, but for everybody's children. Yes. Um, what danger signals should be should we be aware of at church? You know, um, that's that's a tough one. Uh, but I'm going to give you some things, and then I'm going to give a caveat. How's that? So, okay, um, anyone who doesn't belong alone with children, who's trying to get alone with children. Anyone who has no reason to have a relationship with children, but is seeking them out anyway. Um, anyone who refuses or balks at accepting a background check process. Although, I will tell you that a background check process is only a smokescreen as to security. Because a background check is only going to reveal someone who is a convicted sex offender. Not someone who's been arrested and let off the hook multiple times. Not someone who has flown under the radar all of this time and has never gotten arrested yet. And if you check out the book Predators by Anna Salter, the average sex offender or the, the abusive predator has between 50 and 100 victims before their first arrest. And many more after that arrest. So no, almost no one gets convicted on the first arrest. So the first arrest is simply uh, like a stake in time. It's a marking point. And then many more victims after that because the first arrest was not enough to actually result in any kind of conviction or trial prosecution. So when you, when you think of that, we, we realize that a background check is simply a formality. Anyone who is very good at grooming children will also be grooming the community and by grooming I mean that they are becoming a trusted person that everyone really really likes and that's what makes it so hard to believe victims so uh, one one other thing would be anyone who shows or discusses pornography or any form of sexuality outside of an appropriate like a sex education class or something like that to children who is not a parent with the right to do that would also be a red flag but honestly the most dangerous ones may never give you danger signals one in 25 people in the world today are sociopaths and sociopaths did you hear me one in 25 yeah, yeah, people yeah, yeah, yeah. are sociopaths that like that's a, yes and so the book for that is the sociopath next door by martha stout so if anybody wants to read that that's where you that's where you get that statistic um these are, are people who are skilled at manipulating and grooming all the people around them both victims and communities and families and parents and churches so the most important thing above all for danger signals is to actually listen and take appropriate action if someone tells you that they are being abused because that may be very well well, the first time you will know no matter so what should we do if we do actually see something that we're uncomfortable if you like, do actually, actually see something yes symptoms. yes yeah. absolutely so if you do actually see something that you're uncomfortable with observe closely follow the gut instincts that God gave you because oftentimes we feel that something is off but because we can't see visible proof we ignore that feeling for example in my crazy rant video I found out speaking to people who had been members of my church longer than I have that something and I've been in my church for seven years but something like five years ago that same individual had been seen as a visitor randomly hanging outside the women's restroom and talking to teenage girls and like preteen girls and but nobody did anything five years ago nobody said hey we don't know you why are you hanging out here how you doing <laughs> nobody walked up and said anything nobody asked any questions so when we feel that something is off just because we see we cannot see visible proof doesn't mean we should ignore that feeling now it also doesn't mean we should jump down the throat of the person or that we should immediately call the police without any evidence either i'm not advocating extreme crazy action i am saying Observe, pardon? 
like, like a witch hunt. No, yes, like yes. No, no, not a witch hunt. Not a witch hunt. Not a witch hunt. Accusing. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. I'm, I'm not talking about how, like accusing without any evidence of all, at, at all. But however, someone's testimony is evidence. A victim's testimony is evidence. So if you see something, if you're observing something, do not ignore the feelings God gave you that says something isn't quite right. Speak to someone in charge if you see or hear something inappropriate. And if you if you have and someone isn't listening, or if you are the someone in charge and you need more help, talk to an advocacy group, ask a friend in law enforcement, find out more about what you can do. Be proactive because there is nothing more important than keeping our kids safe. Okay, so I've got a little bit of a question on that. So obviously when we're at church with our families, you know, parents, kids, they're all together. Uh, parents and kids are better on their kids. But what happens is, you know, at school, the kids are at school, the parents right. are at work, at home, they have that, that visual on their kids. You know, mm -hmm. How can we know if something untoward is happening at our kids' school? Uh, this is where it is so important to have really healthy, open communication with their kids. Because if you don't have any healthy, open communication with your kids, you might not know. The, the fact is that, and this is not to be negative, but the fact is that sexual abuse carries such a deep sense of shame and secret secrecy intrinsically, even without the mind games that a sexual abuser will will perpetrate on the victim and the surrounding community. So... It is, this is why it is so important to be preemptive in educating our children. Otherwise, unless someone observes something or your child decides to somehow take great steps of courage, you might never know. So coming back to the church setting, like how well equipped are our churches at responding to victims of child abuse? Like I'm concerned, you know, even if, even if we found out about it, like, and we reported it, like, Yes, there are two types of necessary responses. One is reactive, and that is when you realize that something has happened or is happening. And this is all about how you report it, how you take steps to protect the vulnerable, and how you move forward. And that is where we have organizations like um, Safe Place Services for all the different all the different faith based uh, communities, or if you are or Sevi, if you're Adventist, um, Ad Safe. Um, that's where we have Brave Hearts at bravehearts.org.au. Um, that's where we have the amazing Facebook page, facebook.com. Some secrets should never be kept. So those are places you can go and you can get uh, information about how to do healthy reporting, how to, how to take next steps if you are seeing something happen in your in your environment but that so that's just the reactive and that's after you already know something is going on but by that point someone's already been hurt and it's too late so what we really want to also focus on is our proactive steps and how we should respond is by doing some things all the time anyway to educate ourselves and our children about safe touch about consent about finding an adult and telling someone until someone believes you and about never keeping secrets i actually did an entire blog post with the best books and teaching resources for talking to kids about these subjects. And it's on my website and my blog. It's called sarahmcdougall.com slash sex. So if you go there, it's just real simple and easy to find. And all those books and links to those books um, are, are all compiled right there to make it very easy for parents and church leaders to find those resources. Sarah, just a quick question to, um, you know, so compare what you're doing in the U.S. Here. here in Australia, we require a working, working with children's check, which is the equivalent, I guess, of your uh, background check in the mm -hmm. U.S. Okay. Before a person can hold any kind of church office whatsoever at all. Do you have the same kind of system in the United States? We do, um, but there are churches who decline to participate in it. Um, and there are churches who say they participate in it, but then they don't really follow through and stay on top of it every 24 months. Um, there, there's a number of issues like that. So honestly, most churches are deplorably equipped at how to respond to victims of, of abuse. I feel like churches like this need to have a sign out the front. Oh, PS, a reminder, it's a warning when you step in here, we don't do any of this, this or this, so you're on your own. 
I'll tell you, I'll tell you what is another big problem. And that is when you have a registered sex offender attending actively in communities, in faith communities, and the church leaders do not inform the parents or the other church members that there is a registered sex offender in the congregation. And so they're more, the they're being registered. Like, there's no point. exactly, exactly. So the, the, in, in those situations, they're applying um, punishment to the victims or potential victims and, and freedom and grace and understanding to the person who is the perpetrator. And so they have their, their priorities of law and grace all mixed up there. But yeah, uh, I, I could wax eloquent on that for a while, but maybe we have other questions <laughs> to discuss. <laughs> All right. You know, first of all, when you there, there are two categories of child sex abuse victims. There are those who experienced child sex abuse, you know, decades ago. And now they're just finding healing as this is becoming something that people are talking about now. And there are those who are children now and have recently or are currently experiencing sexual abuse. So those are two very different approaches to healing. But I believe that for both categories, um, the first thing that, that they need is safety. To know that they are safe and that they are respected for their value as a person and that what happened to them does not define their value as a person. And second, they need time. Healing comes with time and with being heard. Um, I actually just posted an article on my Facebook page earlier today about how healing is actually almost impossible to achieve for victims of sexual abuse if they are not heard. If their stories are repressed and are silenced, healing has a much harder time coming. So good counseling, faith, and feeling safe and respected again. Sarah, it's been fantastic having you on the show today. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time. We've actually used a little bit of extra time, but um, <laughs> this is a really important <laughs> subject to talk about. Thank so, you for having me. I'm really, I'm really grateful for people like you who stand up in our yep. community, who make a voice, who shine a light on these issues. Um, and we are going to put links up to uh, all the things you've mentioned in your in your. Um, in our interview today because you did mention quite a few resources, articles and videos mm -hmm. and I think a lot of our listeners are going to want to have a YouTube, a, Facebook, blog, etc. Yeah, there's a couple of books you mentioned as well so our listeners right. will often call us up and say, I want that book so we're going to have to get a lot of links from you uh, once we finish <laughs> here and, and put, put them all up for which we are very grateful. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. We're going to need to get Sarah back again sometime but right now we need to move on as our time is almost up and we'll be having a great opportunity right after this short break.